Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Pieszczenski. I'm part of ACI team in Red Hat. I work as an Agile practitioner. And today, I want to share a few things about my experience with change management, especially the things and areas where you can fail, because these are the ones everyone loves the most. Uh, before I start it, this is just what you can expect from today's sessions. 25 minutes of my long and boring monologue, and then I left five minutes towards the end for your interesting questions. I think it's a fair balance. We see how it works in the reality and if we can fit in the time frames. Also, if you have any questions, I know this can be more difficult in person and in reality than on online meetings when you have computer and you can write it down, but try to remember them, write them down, and ask them towards the end of the presentation. And that's just because of the time frames and things I want to cover. I don't want to lose track and make sure we just go through all of the slides because they are all very interesting and important for the topic. OK, and just a little more details about the areas I'm going to talk today. I'm going to share a four examples with you of where I think people often fail when trying to introduce and embrace the change. It can be change within the teams, but it can be as easy as like changing something in your life. Like you can connect it with a different stories. I will do that through, uh, I had actually four stories, but that was too long, so I cut it to three stories and one success story to, towards the end. We will talk about some indicators, so what can tell you, oh, I might be doing this wrong. Uh, it's a kind of early alarm bell for you. We're going to talk also about uh, how you can manage these challenges. So I realized I'm not doing something which I should be doing. Probably is there something I can do to improve the situation? And then, last but not the least, what if I already did this and it's just the whole situation happened? Is there any way how to reverse the process, how to improve it again? And what is the best way to start the presentation? Is there any better way that we have a quote? Uh, the author of this quote, it's not that important, uh, but I think the message here is really strong. It says, change may not always bring growth, but there is no growth without the change. And if we just take a few seconds and we think about it and try to think about it from perspective of your professional life, but also your personal life, like what really shapes our lives? Uh, are the changes or what we experience like that? These are the things that probably build us as a person, as teams. If you think about those changes which happened to you and how they changed you through your life, was it changed that you planned ahead so you have a possibility to prepare yourself? Was the motivation coming from you? Or was it you just needed to adapt to external environment and you could, like, we, many times in life we face the situation when we can adapt or live, if we go all the way back to theory of evolution, like organisms who could adapt best, survive to new conditions. It is the same in life, in work as well. Like if we manage to adapt to new circumstances, only the companies that can embrace the newest trends that come up with new ideas and can adapt to rapidly changing market requirements will be the most successful ones and everyone else was just there somewhere in behind, forgotten. So from my work as an Agile practitioner, I come into these situations quite a lot. I go to the teams introducing the changes. Sometimes, like, my ultimate goal is always to make this coming from the teams. If I can make the situation seem like it wasn't an idea from my side, but it was their own idea, and they are the ones that, like, that's like, golden case scenario, which is very difficult to achieve. But I can see the trends in the people. That's why I separate people uh, in terms of change management in uh, buses and, can someone help me with the name of the cowboy? Uh, Moody, Woody, yeah, thank you. So those buses and Woody's, if you don't know the Toy Story, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more about them. The bus was always really positive. He was just going straight ahead to anything what stayed in his way. So optimistic, full of energy. Woody, Woody liked his comfort. He liked the old ways, how everything was settled. 
And that, there is a lot of prejudice in terms of uh, IT world and how are people here uh, in IT. Lots of people are saying that people here are conservative. They don't like the changes for last five years. I'm trying to break down these opinions. And I can see that people in IT, they actually, yes, they like the routines. Mo most of us probably do. But they also like to improve. That's why we're just working in the industry with the most intelligent people in the world. So it just hugely depends how you're going to introduce these changes and ideas. And a lot of people need to understand why we're going to do this. That's a super important part. And let's get to the few scenarios or stories which I promised to share. Uh, first, uh, I called assuming to know ev everything. And it happened to me. In this scenario, you don't necessarily need to be as my friend has a golden retriever, so just for the sake of this scenario, I'm going to call him Charles. If there is any Charles here, don't be offended, please. And I don't know, by looking at Charles, I don't think he has an idea what he's doing. But in many terms, uh, you can have someone with uh, years of experience, ton of knowledge, and it's easy to slip in, the, that, in that word thinking like, you know, I know what needs to be done. I'm not going to listen to anyone else. And this is how it's going to be. And that's not up to the discussion. And that's a very dangerous uh, area where you can get yourself to. Oh. First story. And it's from my personal experience. When I started uh, my first job as a Scrum Master, I had few experiences like from working as a project management uh, manager, managing people, but I was like, really motivated and really keen to make it work. That's why I started with some conversations uh, with the director and other leadership. They said, we want to introduce Scrum. I was like, yeah, perfect. I know Scrum. No problem. I came to the team without like, even asking team what they think about it. What do they think they would prefer to do? I just said, yeah, we're going to do Scrum. Like, this is how Scrum looks. Here are the ceremonies, definition of done, definition of ready. Here you go. Take it. It took us like two months to implement everything. And I was super proud of myself. Like, you know, people doing this for years. Like, I've done it in two months. Here you go. You're welcome. <laughs> I can move on to a different team. You can probably imagine how it ended up. When I spoke with the team after I realized, OK, I should like, probably consult these people as well. Uh, they told me, like, yes, in Jira and other tools, everything looked perfect. We had meetings in place. Cards were moving. On the meetings, we talked about cards. We updated the card. But the reality, everyone was doing exactly the same as they did before. But on the top of that, they were doing all of those new things. You can probably imagine that didn't end up so well. And now, I hope I'm a little bit wiser. So I know that at the beginning, it's important to just concentrate on the people, on this why and what you want to achieve, and build the bridges at the beginning. What I did here instead was, if there were some bridges, I just destroyed them all, <laughs> and also push people to build the really high walls <laughs> between those sides of the river. So it made it extremely difficult for me to come back to the team to gain the trust. I, man I managed, but it, just, it was a huge setback. So the important thing or message from uh, this one, if you're going to do any change within the team, within your household or something, just concentrate on everyone who's going to be involved. Don't rush it. Spend the time talking to people to make sure you really understand what is the situation about. And if you're going to go through this process, have people involved as much as possible. If you already did the same silly mistake as I did, then it's just going to take much more time to rebuild the trust, rebuild the relationships, but it's not impossible. We all people, we make mistakes, so don't be afraid to admit you made one and learn from it. Go ahead. Okay. Brings me to my next slide. I think uh, one of the mistakes uh, people do often is fear to fail. Oh, 
if you're an actor who knows he's gonna die for certain in first series or first part of the movie, you probably <laughs> don't fear anything and you can still be a great actor and successful. Uh, in the terms of us failing, I noticed two trends. Sometimes we want to be perfectionists, so we just fear that we're gonna fail, that's why we don't start something. It can be at work, at our own lives, like many people, simple story about, well, after New Year, everyone wants to start with the gym, go to the diet, but they don't, they don't start from the starting point where they are. They, they just want to get like all in at the beginning, having everything done in the first week, so they do five sessions first week, eating just salad and chicken and lots of protein, and then they found out like they feel really tired and they can't exercise that often, then they give up. So the sustainable pace is important, as well as achievable goals. But in many cases, we can also fear from being successful, because sometimes when we have such a good idea and as it grows in our head and we introduce it to someone and then this just starts to build up, it can be a really scary thing to like, if you get to that point, you know, it can really work. It can be a success. Then you're like, mm, I never expected this. I probably can't take the responsibility. So I <laughs> step away or just stop it now. I don't want to see this happening. Uh, I have another story uh, for this one. And that goes all the way back to my university when I was writing my bachelor's thesis. And I thought, you know, I wanted to make it perfect. I knew I need to do it when I want to get my degree. So first six months, I haven't written a single line. I had so many books, like you could read them probably for 10 years. So many resources, I've spoken to so many people. Not a single line. Then a lot of stress kicked in because the deadline was coming closer. So I needed to really redefine like, okay, if I don't hand over anything, I will fail for certain. But if I do at least something, maybe it will be good enough to be accepted. So I handed over the first version, then we improved it. And at the end, I got A, but I, I would never get to that A version at the beginning. I needed to start it with something, some draft format. Oh. So how you can manage this situation? Oh, within the teams, if we're gonna take a oh, talk about the concrete example now, uh, it's concentrate on something achievable, something which is going to make a real difference. Sometimes we can call it minimum viable product. Then build on that step by step, test it out. If it's working, great, continue. If it doesn't work, just move to something else. Third uh, mistake which I identified was that a lot of people don't spend uh, enough time in uh, building the relationships and identifying their early supporters. You can see maybe some connections uh, from this first point with number one. The difference between those two for me, it's really like when you put most of your effort because yes, you need to listen to people, but if you come to the situation, there's gonna be always buzzes and woodies and you need to find out like what is the real situation in the team because there can be really loud voices which can steer the mood towards one direction and everyone can think like, oh, this is really horrible because like everyone's saying just the negative things about this. But then if you ask people individually, you can find out the reality is totally different. And at the beginning, of course, if you're introducing a change, you wanna talk to everyone, listen to everyone. But if there is a person who's just gonna moan about it and criticize without any constructive feedback over and over, you just need to build a wall for a certain time from those people and just concentrate really your energy and time to people who give you constant, uh, constructive feedback and who are willing to participate in this. That can really help you. This is the story which I needed to cut out, but it's gonna be part of the success story at the end. So. Uh, uh, but just to sum it up really quickly, this is quite straightforward. Uh, some indicators might be that you're just driving all the change on your own. Every idea, it's coming from you. You need to chase people about doing things, like nothing's coming from the team. You can manage it, as I mentioned, just by to talk and listening to the people. If you 
already did it, that you don't have this early support, like that's not a huge mistake. You can still build this team around you in area, any area that you need to manage the change in. It just, the sooner you start with building this team, the better. And last but not least, everyone's favorite scope creeping. Uh, I like this meme because it just says, yeah, you can't scope creep if you don't have a scope. I heard from many teams uh, that, yeah, this is great. We're going to do Scrum or we're going to bring in Kanban. That means like you know, we don't have to have any plan, any commitment. We just do like every day I wake up, I do something. I might update the ticket, but you know, if you ask me, is it going to be done in a month, in two weeks? Like, oh, I'm working Scrum. Miracles happen. Sometimes they happen. Sometimes they don't. So <laughs> you just have to wait two weeks and you will see. So this is a big uh, misunderstanding of uh, some of the agile frameworks by people. And I have a one example from my life about scope creeping. I don't know about like how you do this, but me and my girlfriend, uh, we go food shopping once a week. We just rarely do online shopping. And if I go shopping, like in many cases, I just finish the work. I don't have time to eat and we go shopping. We have a nice shopping list. You can imagine how it usually ends. If I'm hungry, I'm just going like crazy. I, I buy everything. And then I look back at that shopping list and half of the shopping list is not even covered, but we have like 10 times as, as many things as we had on the shopping list originally. So the second scenario, it's imagine doing the same shopping when you are in the rush. So you're not hungry, nothing, but you just need to get it done quickly. Then you end up with the different results as well. And ideal case scenario, when you eaten enough, you have enough time, you have your list all the time in the world, just go through the shop. All the patients in the world for me <laughs> as well, because when I can't find something, then I'd rather not have it. Uh, then you get probably as close to your shopping list as possible. How it connects to our work, it's that if you implement the changes or trying to do some changes, always think it in the bigger picture because circumstances can influence the achievable scope. But also, if you don't define the scope, that's like a big no-go, number one. But the second one, what can influence your scope, it's some important releases coming up. Or Christmas holiday, summer holiday, people will be on the vacation. So I probably don't want to do a massive change with the team in three weeks when half of the team or 70%, 90% won't be there. With the release situation, if, we, if everyone's concentrating on the release and if you're pushing to them like, okay, can you make this decision and can we just introduce this to the team, you won't get the same results that you would get after that release possibly. Okay, so just to try to wrap it up what I set so far and when you're doing the changes like everyone's gonna make mistake you shouldn't be afraid to make them that's how we learn the bad situation where you can get it's when you build an environment where people don't feel confident to share those mistakes then if you manage to build this trust and good relationships you have a really good foundations for making any changes successful because it's a different big big difference making a change and make a successful change if it's coming from the people you're getting regular feedback you're just setting yourself towards the right direction to make it right uh, and considering the feedback you know, not everyone feels confident to share the feedback straight away speak in the meeting where we have 20 30 people some people are just, you know, think it might not be that important. So different reasons why people won't share feedback. So try to find as many feedback loop loops as possible. Talk to people, but at the same time, retrospectives are a great idea how to uh, get feedback from the teams. You can do different surveys, like more feedback you can get. Of course, there is a balance. If you're going to ask people the same questions every two weeks, you're going to get the same answers and then you won't get any answers probably because they will just get annoyed. But if you can find a good balance in this, then you can really get a lot out of it. And I promised you a success story. So does anyone know this guy? 
Yes. Yeah. Right. So yeah, well done. Yeah. So exactly, this is Craig Ramsey, and he's from Canada. He's ice hockey coach. Uh, right now for the national team of Slovakia. But he, before, he was a coach in NHL. Like, the biggest achievement probably you can do as an ice hockey coach. And then he came to this little country with five million people as a head coach. And he exactly, like, I think this is one of my favorite change managers after Ted Lasso probably. <laughs> uh, he didn't come there like, you know, I'm the expert from NHL and this is what you need to do to be successful. He really spent a lot of time to get to know people in Slovakia, the Ice Hockey Federation, everyone around, and then he showed them his vision and he was trying to make it their own vision. It was super complicated at the beginning. There was a lot of pushback, uh, but I think Right now, he proved after like five, six, seven years that it's really working. And he managed to uh, make a great result uh, with our team. He was also not afraid to experiment. So when he thought like, okay, this is what can work, and he just found that we don't have the place for this. So he shifted other direction. And uh, this is something, again, with a relation to the ice hockey. So if you don't like ice hockey, I apologize for <laughs> too many connections. Uh, and this is something, I don't know, probably many people said it before, but this came out uh, during my consultation with one of the colleagues from Red Hat about the changes. And I feel like, oh, this is a brilliant idea. We need to have this in the presentation. Uh, success can slow down the change. And it's so true. Like, don't confuse a short-term success for the state where you want to be. And sometimes, another coloration with Slovakia and ice hockey, we were in a real decline. And then in 2012, we went second uh, in the International Cup. And everyone's like, uh, everyone knew that what we are doing with young people, how we're supporting the clubs and everything, that it's not working. But after this, everyone was like, it's working somehow, like we got second. How other we could get second? It can be same in the work, like if you deliver project on the time or if you just manage to get that release done and it means, you know, your whole team spent two last two weeks working 20 hours a day just to have it done. And then at the end of the day, you can't say just, yeah, we did it, it's working. We don't need to change anything. Always think further ahead and the broader context. And that gets us to the end of the presentation and to your questions, if you have any. Yes? So uh, you said that you were doing project management before. So what made you switch to Agile? And does it complement each other or is it just have to go against each other? So I think it can do both. It can complement, but uh, in like pure theory, these roles go against each other if you look at the pure definitions. And for me, that was what like pushed me towards the agile direction because I really enjoyed the project management from the beginning. Just like good to, I like to work with people, communicate with people, but there was a lot of business side on the top of that. Tracking the deadlines, checking the budget constantly, in many cases, it was about making pressure on the people, like, you know, we need to get this done, and then call them again, like, are you working on this, and chasing people. Uh, this is something completely different from me in the terms, like, I can really get close to the people, and instead of saying to them, you know, I need you to get this done by tomorrow, like, I, I spoke with customer, it's, if we don't get it done, we don't get the project, then uh, here, you can really come to the team and get the insights from them. What do you think we can improve? I have a lot of knowledge. Everyone in the similar role probably has, but when you come to the team, every single team, you can learn something different. 
I think that's what those is the most beautiful part with the projects you just know this stress like you you need to get the project at the beginning once you get the project everyone calms down because yes we got the project and then the second stressful phase is like we need to deliver this first part so that's when you're pushing everyone but this is like smoother continuous process and much more about people not about that business side that's what I love about it okay are there any other questions I think it differs a lot in Red Hat from what I know. If you say agile practitioner, sometimes it can mean someone works with the team on daily basis and oh, sometimes just this person works with the whole organization. Sometimes this person can take more from the project management. Sometimes it's more about training, coaching. So in Red Hat, I think which is great that everyone in this role can evolve as they would like to and of if I compare it with other companies, like uh, I worked for the company when they saw, for example, an uh, agile coach or scrum master, someone as a manager as well, and we had a lot of conversations about it, and uh, they saw this role more of someone like managing and tracking the project rather than working with people. But I, al I was probably lucky because many companies I worked for have the exactly like understand the role exactly the same as I do. And this is important for me when I was doing the interviews or something like, if I know that we have the same definition and we understand the same things under the role, that's a, where we can collaborate. Yes? So it's about learning from the past and gathering some data. So if you want to learn, if you're improving, you should have it backed up with some data. And then if you have those trackers, then you can compare it like, you know, we just, we haven't changed anything and we did this really great. But if you can see the diff similar 10 scenarios from the past, you did really bad. Then you can say, okay, this was just one time success. And if you can see this trends like, Sometimes you can find out from the data that you know, we just got really successful in this area and we never, uh, we never changed anything, like what happened? And you might find out, oh, you know, we just, someone from the team started to act differently with the customer or customer just hired someone else to communicate with the team. Like it can be a lot of factors, but as long as you have some data to look at and compare it, then you can say, is it a trend? Is it just one time thing? Okay. Yes. Mm, that's a difficult one. I, <laughs> I think uh, what can help a lot is that starting point because in many, most of the cases when I go to the team, it's like we don't want you here. We don't want to hear from you. Just don't tell us about Jira or Confluence or Scrum. Just, we know how to do our job and leave us alone. <coughs> uh, if you can show people that your job really is to help them to improve what, uh, their daily life and you can make a lot of things easier for them that can help you with the resistance. So building those relationships, but at the same time, uh, sometimes you can identify some quick wins for the team. One of the, I can think of it's like lots of teams working under a lot of pressure because uh, many software companies have li limited resources, lots of customers, so there's a pressure on the team to deliver fast. And if you don't have a process behind it, then just you end up sooner or later uh, burning out because you try to work on everything, you're just jumping from topic to topic. But if you can put some system that can re really protect the team from this burnout and that they can prioritize things, uh, it can show it, it. It can be a really good sign for the company, but for the team themselves as well. So basically, understanding the team work system as well and this organization as well. Understand them, but also build those relationships because then 
like resistance coming you know, comes a lot of time just from people not knowing what to expect. And then we just, our natural tendency is like, I don't know what to expect from this, so I'm just gonna push back because uh, someone's just gonna, you know, impact my safe space environment and I don't want that person to do that. If you show people that that's not the case, but you're just here to help them to build that word with them. Yes? So can you, the way you speak about this, I, I feel that it's mostly that the paradigm that we have is that uh, you're, you're talking to uh, a team uh, that's resistant to change. But what if, have you ever dealt with a scenario where the resistance to change comes from people at the bottom? Mm -hmm. Uh, you have a goal, and then you need to sell that. Because if you just if you just kind of try to power through it, you might be subjected to institutional blockers, mm -hmm. as I like to call them. So, uh, what are your insights for breaking through this type of resistance? What are some effective techniques that you maybe had the chance to use? Okay, so I'm maybe start with the red hat because in red hat I never ever dealt with something like this and. Uh, I had the different challenges in terms of leadership was like, you know, do whatever you want, but I'm going to support it, but I'm not going to push people because it's up to the people. And sometimes just you need to make the decisions. You will sooner or later, you come to the point when you need to make a decision, especially if you deal with a larger group of people, you can have the endless conversations. Oh, yeah. I, d I don't have the direct experience like with leadership not supporting it, but I have experience when leadership was supporting it, but what they actually meant was, you know, we want to do this because then, you know, everyone, every single developer can book all their time on the Jira ticket. And we can build the customers based on that. We can track their progress. So that was a different fight, but I, I still needed to have this fight. And uh, I think it was equally difficult conversation. And then it's just, you just need to, again, I try to use the data in most of the scenarios that I can. And I show them the projects from the past, like, you know why you failed in those projects? Like, uh, I have a messages from the teams and feedback why they think we failed. And this is what we can improve. But if you're gonna do this, we try, always, also, you can try it with the team. Like, if, if you even know it's a nonsense, you can try just to prove uh, and have the data for, I don't know if that answered your question. Or it does. based on which the resistance you're encountering, you know, on which the resistance you're encountering is based, is also important because, yeah, if, it's, if, if a broken process makes somehow makes more money, that's kind of a hard thing to go against because, like, good luck convincing someone to, uh, to make less <laughs> voluntarily to improve something else. Uh, the other thing that I'm, I'll keep wondering about, maybe I can catch you after the Mm -hmm. So that's a very difficult one, and I would say if it's just a no, then the problem is somewhere like much more deeper, and you just need to dig into it, or, or higher. <laughs> I meant like in terms of deeper, like, you know, it's just no one just says purely no. There has to be some reasons, and unless you know these reasons, because how the collaboration from my perspective, like how I can collaborate with someone who just, you know, says no with any reason. Yeah, I, I understand, but yeah, this is, this is a maddeningly uh, difficult thing to grasp because when you can't see what you're fighting, metaphorically speaking, it's really hard to detect it. Uh, I think that's not something we can resolve here, but I was genuinely curious about whether uh, you had the experience and thank you for... Yeah, I'm happy to catch up after the talk and uh, but in general, yeah, in some cases, you know, you might just need someone from outside to help the resolve the situation because there are many scenarios when, like, the trust has been broken already and no one from within can rebuild it. So you just need someone from outside who can look at it with fresh eyes and just help people to manage through this difficult situation. Yes? We have an example of that at my employer. Um, the 
um, senior teams have decided that we had adopted a certain product. None of the engineers actually doing it wanted to do it. So we all just drank and eventually they gave up on it. Yeah, thank you for sharing. That can, but you don't always have the luxury to share. But of course, it can. Like, if you can share it with people and make the decision and involve more people in the decision, that can help as well. Okay. Yeah, I'm just getting the straight signal. That's <laughs> we're done. So, thank you very much.